All right, guys, we'll start this whole thing over again. I'm Dr. Oliver. I'm here to talk to you guys tonight about degenerative disc disease. All right, I'm going to tell you what it is, what it isn't, how it comes about, and what we could do about it. So if you guys have any more technical difficulties, you can't hear the audio, can't see me, just drop it into the chat to let us know, and we can restart it, we can go over things again. Basically, the reason I wanted to talk to you guys about this topic is I see people come into my office all the time for their initial appointment, and they tell me, Doc, I got degenerative disc disease. And more often than not, they went to their primary care or maybe an orthopedic. They took some x-rays and they were told, you have degenerative disc disease. And it kind of worries them. Basically, being told you have a disease is worrisome to people. So tonight, I think it's good we dive into it. We learn what it is, what it isn't, and kind of just explore whether we should be worried about it. And if we do have it, better ways to avoid irritating it. So the basic thing we need to know is what is degenerative disc disease? So if we look at your spine, We'll look at the vertebrae. That's basically these white portions right here. And in between the vertebrae are your discs. So if we see any thinning or breaking down of that disc for any reason, we call that degenerative disc disease. The adding the word disease to it is a misnomer, though, because it's not really a disease. It's a naturally occurring process that happens to all of us. Some of us get it earlier in life. Some of us get it later in life. Some of us get it more in life. So it varies, but we all get it to some degree. The way I put this to my patients when we talk about it is it's like wrinkles on the inside. When we think of wrinkles in our skin, everybody gets wrinkles. Again, some people get wrinkles at an earlier age. Some people get wrinkles as they age. And other people get more wrinkles. Some people get less wrinkles. So all wrinkles are is breakdown of collagen in your skin. So it's a natural breakdown process that happens to everybody. It's part of the human condition. Same thing happens on the inside of us. We get breakdown of tissues. So degenerative disc disease is a naturally occurring process. So how do people really find out about this? Again, most people I find come to my office after they had a bout of neck pain or back pain, and they go see their primary care or they go see an orthopedic, and depending on the symptoms, depending on the severity, they might order x-rays. That's usually the first imaging studies they'll do. And from those x-rays, more often than not, we're gonna see at least a little bit of degenerative disc disease. It's extremely commonplace. So it's something that we need to know more about and not necessarily worry about, but I get why people become worried about it when they come in the office. It's understandable that a primary care or an orthopedic will point to the degenerative disc disease because someone's coming with pain and they wanna give that patient an answer. If someone comes to me and they come with pain in their knee, they want an answer, why does my knee hurt? So if you go to your primary care and they tell you, oh, yep, you have degenerative disc disease, the radiologist read it right here in the report, you have pain in your low back, that's your issue. But a lot of times it's more complicated than this. So what exactly is, is happening here? So we need to look at the discs. So if we look at the vertebrae, right? So we got these two nice vertebrae here in the middle, this tan area, this nice and plump and nice and thick, that's a nice healthy disc. We wanna see that. Well, over time that can thin out. What the disc is comprised of is essentially like a jelly donut. It's got an outer ring that's firm, and inside there's a jelly-like material. The jelly-like material has fluid in it, and over time, through a natural process, you start to lose some of that fluid. So you get a thinning and a hardening of that disc. So again, it's a natural process that occurs over time, so it's not necessarily something to be super worried about or fearful of. Now, people ask all the time, how common is this? It's extremely common. Just like I said, it's a natural part of aging. They've done a bunch of studies on it though, and usually when they study this, they're gonna look at asymptomatic people, so people with no pain at all. They'll take x-rays and they'll evaluate it from there. There was one large study done where they took thousands of people starting in their 20s all the way up through their 80s, and they took a bunch of x-rays. And what they found was in your 20s, the general population had 37% chance of degenerative disc disease. So just in your 20s, just out of your teens, we see a third of the population start to have degenerative disc disease. In your 80s, it was 96%, so basically everybody. And then your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, we all saw a progression of the, of the process there. So it's a naturally occurring process that we see. Now, just because it is common, doesn't mean it can't cause pain, because it can. So when you start to lose that disc, that shock absorbs capability, so basically that plump disc that has that fluid helps absorb shock, allows for fluid movement. Well, when you start to thin that out and lose that ability, you have to transfer the stress somewhere. One of the most common ways you're gonna transfer stress 
if you don't have the disc, is to the joints in the back. So if you start putting a lot of pressure and irritation into these joints, you could start to wear them out too. It's a different process called degenerative joint disease, which is closely associated with this, but it's just another way to irritate. But more often than not, what I see is the muscles that run up and down the, the back. Because the disc isn't absorbing as much pressure or can't absorb as much pressure anymore, you're gonna see more activation of those muscles. So almost everybody that has chronic back pain from degenerative disc disease is gonna have increased muscle tension in their back. It's just your body's way of responding to what's going on. These people often get spasm events as well, and you'll see acute situations where their back locks up on them. So we see that as a naturally occurring process, but it can cause pain. If it gets bad enough, we could start to really affect that disc. So if we really start to compress the disc, really start to squeeze down on that jelly donut, we could squirt the jelly out actually. So if you get enough wear and tear, this model is supposed to represent what can happen over time. So you'll see that red area there is the disc. As we get some compressive load to it, we could see it kind of pop out a little bit, right? So that's an extreme case of it. But if that disc were to pop out, it could start to affect the nerve that's in the area. These yellow things that are coming out are nerves. They go down, they innervate your legs, they innervate your arms if we're talking about your neck. But if you get irritation or compression against that nerve root, you can get symptoms that travel down your legs or your arms. Now, you may not have that. We've again seen in imaging studies, it's very commonplace to have bulges and herniations with no pain at all. But you definitely can have pain. The other thing we wanna look at is we talked about that nice, healthy, thick disc here, right? Well, that allows for a nice, thick opening on the side, a big circular opening for the nerve to come out. Again, that nerve comes out and either goes down your leg or it can go down your arm. Well, over time, you're gonna see a thinning of the disc, right? So this is a nice, thick disc, this is thinner. And then again, even a more progressive stage of it, it's really thin at this point. You can see this hole here is smaller now. So you take that, that hole, that foramen on the side, and you start to narrow it down well, the nerve that goes through there can start to get irritated. So again, you can get symptoms that radiate, ridiculous symptoms. It could be numbness, it could be tingling. It could just be pain. Uh, if it gets bad enough, you could start to actually get weakness to, to develop. These are more concerning signs, but if it gets bad enough, you can lead to this as well. Now, because we have ridiculous symptoms or because we have symptoms like this, is it necessarily a cause for true concern? We can deal with these treatment. There's many treatment options for them. There are a few symptoms that we wanna be uh, conscious of and look out for. So if we see sudden onset of weakness in a leg or an arm, or we see really progressive weakness start to develop, that's not really a good sign. We wanna get you evaluated. You should go see your chiropractor, go see your primary care in orthopedic. You should really get a thorough evaluation to see if something acute is going on. There's other very rare symptoms that can occur as well that we consider red flags and we want, if we see them and it's an emergent situation. So one of the extreme ones would be like inability to urinate or controlling urination, abnormal weird numbness that straddles your back or goes into your groin and your thighs. If you saw anything like this, you would want to seek attention immediately. But again, these are very rare. We tend to not see these occur in people, but we, it's, it's important to be aware of it. So we've talked about the process. We've talked about what it is, what it is, and how common it is. And yeah, it can cause pain. So if we know it can cause pain, we need to figure out what can make it worse, what can contribute to this condition. So there are risk factors. Some of the major risk factors are obesity, smoking, and trauma. So obesity, laws of physics, increase the load, you're gonna increase the pressure, you're gonna irritate the disc more. So maintaining a healthy weight is really important. It'll reduce the stress on the spine and the vertebrae and the discs, therefore, therefore reducing some of that irritation, hopefully slowing the progression of the degenerative disc disease. The smoking aspect, we know smoking affects the vascular system significantly. It affects our ability to transfer nutrients in and out of areas. So we know people that smoke have a much higher degree of degenerative disc disease. So smoking, besides for everything else, is important for avoiding if you have degenerative disc disease. And then trauma. It's difficult to avoid motor vehicle trauma or if you fall, but there's other types of trauma as well. You got repetitive loading. So someone that spends all day bending, picking up bricks, or they spend a lot of day in the garden. You know, these movements can cause repetitive trauma, which can be avoided or just modified. So it's important to recognize these things and know what's going on. Now, 
we see those things as contributing factors, but I think hands down, the patients that come in my office, the biggest contributing factor is the postures they main th maintain throughout the day. They've studied this as well. So what they've done is they've measured the pressure inside the discs in your lumbar spine, so your low back, in different positions. The least stressful position is lying down flat on your back. It's about 25 kilograms of pressure in your lumbar discs. The most stressful position is sitting in a chair, hunched over, trying to pick something up. That's about 275 kilograms of pressure. The second most stressful position is just hunched over, picking a load up. We're about 225 on that one. And then the third most is just sitting without a load. Again, sitting in a position that most people assume throughout the day, which is hunched, okay? So what do all three of these more stressful positions have in common? flexion at your lumbar spine, right? So if we flex upon a disc, we know we put more pressure and load into it. So flexion is something we want to look out for, and we want to try to avoid it if we can or modify it. So anybody, any one of my patients that sits at a computer more than an hour or two a day, I tell them at a minimum, get up and move, but I want all of them to get sit-stand desks. Nowadays, they're readily available, they're relatively inexpensive, but what a sit-stand desk does is allow you to sit and stand, obviously, right? So you could sit for short periods, you could stand, you could sit again, you could stand. If we can constantly move that position, we decrease the load on the discs, therefore decreasing the stress and hopefully preventing or delaying the onset of the degenerative disc disease. Most of my patients, when I have them transfer into a sit-stand situation, I tell them, to certain rules, okay? You're no longer allowed to sit longer than 30 to 40 minutes in a row. Studies actually show it's 20 minutes where it's negative effects happen, but I know that's difficult for most people, so I let my patients get away with 30 to 40 minute stretches, then they have to get up. Once people get comfortable with it, most people can stand an hour or two at a time, sometimes even more, but the key is movement. You don't wanna stand all day either. You wanna be up and down. And then once you get really adjusted to a sit-stand, I think the best thing is to be standing about 60 to 70% and then sitting about 30 to 40% of the time. But don't go out and do that tomorrow if you've been sitting all day. It's gonna take weeks or months to build up to that. If you just start standing all day long, your knees will hurt, your back will start hurting, you'll have a whole, whole host of other issues. We don't need to do that. So just slowly transition into it. But don't sit for more than 30 to 40 minutes at a time. So sitting hands down, I think, is, is, is the biggest problem people have, and it's the reason most people see me that nowadays. But we also have to look at other things, that flexion, right? We talked about lifting a load. There's different ways that you can bend. Basically, there's two main ways I see with people. Most people will bend through their back to pick something up, right? The proper way to bend is really through your hips, and you want to hinge through here without actually bending in here. So instead of this, we want to hinge through here. So there's a little trick we can do for that. If you're at home, you can grab a broom handle or any stick, and you're going to hold it, and you're going to put it one hand, you're going to put it at the back of your head, you're going to take your other hand, you're going to turn it under, you're going to put it right at your belt line, and then you're going to have it touch in between your shoulder blades, so three points of contact. And I don't want you to do anything, I don't want you to think about it, I just want you to bend over and see what happens. So if you bend properly, all three points are gonna remain in contact. So down here at your belt line, your mid back and your head. If you bend even a little bit in your low back, you'll start to see this lower hand come off. So that means in here somewhere I bent. If it's bad enough where you see a lot of people do, it's this, right? So that's all lower spinal flexion that we wanna to try to avoid. So when someone bends over, what we wanna do is actually move through your, <laughs> move through your butt first. So the first thing that should move on you when you bend over is your butt. It should go backwards. So as you're here, you want to feel your weight shift backwards and you're hinging off your hip. So I can go from this position all the way to here and I didn't even bend my back at all yet. Most people aren't going to be able to get to that point. I get that. And most of the time it's going to be because your hamstrings, the tension in your hamstrings. So what you do is as you're bending through your hip, just bend your knees a little bit. It'll, it'll take some slack out of your hamstrings It'll allow you to move more fluidly. And over time, as you practice this, it'll get better. And you may have to do some soft tissue work, foam rolling on your hamstrings, or just general mobility work. And 
We have a lot of videos on the website, backintelligence.com, on our YouTube page. You can find out ways to do that as well. But we want to address this as fluidly as we can and as best we can. So sitting, again, we're never going to avoid sitting, but we want to sit better. And if you do have to sit, you want something like a lumbar support in your back here. You want something to fill that void so you're not rounded out. Again, it's that rounding position that's really going to stress you. And then modify the way that you bend. It's simple. We bend to pick up our kids. We bend to pick up the toys off the ground. We bend to pick up a pencil. Every time we bend, even if it's not heavy, you need to learn to bend through your hips. So a lot of people are going to say, well, I can't get to the ground doing that. So people will be like, well, I can't get down there. Well, if you can't get down there, then you need to go to a knee. So again, you can limit the spinal movement that way. But you want to avoid flexing through that spine. Because every time you do it, you're causing irritation. The more we do it, the more stress, the more degenerative changes we're going to see in those discs over time. So modify those positions, really important. So what else can we do? What are other forms of treatment or other things that we can do? Well, the good news is surgery is hardly ever a good option for these things. Even in the significant cases, we're starting to see with the research and the studies show that even if you have significant symptoms, surgery long term is not a great option. Almost all of these conditions can be treated conservatively. So a lot of people go see their chiropractor like me, you go see a physical therapist, and there's a lot that can be done with joint manipulation, soft tissue work, and exercise therapy. So seeing a therapist, seeing someone to treat you is important, but there's a lot of stuff you can do yourself. I'm a big proponent of giving exercise and giving things for people to do at home. I tell my patients all the time, every, almost every time I meet someone for the first time, I tell my patients, my job is easy, your job is hard. Why? My job, I manipulate you, I work soft tissue, I've done it long enough that that's relatively easy to me. And then I teach you how to do exercise. Your job is to change your habits. You have to change your sitting habits, you have to change the way you bend, and you have to do the exercises I tell you. If you could do those things, you're going to be okay. But you have to take ownership of your own situation. And I think that's the big hurdle for people. A lot of people I see will get better pretty quickly. I'll adjust them, we'll work soft tissue. They start to feel better. And to be honest, they stop doing the things I ask them to do because they feel better. But in reality, it all comes back. Why? Because they go back to sitting as much as they did. They go back to bending the way they did. They go back to lifting their kids up. They don't do their exercises. So you have to take ownership. No one else is going to do it for you. Yes. Replacing hands-on therapy is difficult. Seeing me, there's certain things I can do that you can't do. Seeing a massage therapist, there's a lot of things that hands-on therapy can do that you can't do on your own. But exercise is easily done at home. You can also do a lot of soft tissue work. So working on the muscles themselves, there's self-myofascial release. You could use a foam roller. You could use a lacrosse ball. You could use a theracane. There's a variety of ways to do that. Again. We have instruction on all this stuff. Just go to the website, backintelligence.com. Check out the articles we have, the videos. We have videos on YouTube. It's going to explain all this stuff. You want to work on this stuff. And when it comes to exercise, it comes down to this. You could change your postures. You could avoid the sitting. You could avoid the, the bending that properly. You still may have some issues. It's because you have an underlying weakness, possibly. Most people I see, at least in my office, tend to be weak in their core. So what is your core? So people think about their core, what do they think about? If I asked you what your core muscles were, almost everybody I asked would say, oh, my abs, my abdominal wall. And that's true, but there's dozens of other muscles you've never even heard of. Little muscles that connect each vertebrae together. You have muscles deep inside your pelvic bowl that are super important. These muscles are actually, I would say, more important because they get neglected. So you need to learn a proper way to turn these on. A lot of people want to do exercise that's fun and fancy, and I applaud them for that. But if you can't do a basic dead bug exercise without moving your back or irritating your back or a basic bridge or basic core stability exercises, you shouldn't be doing any of that stuff. You got to crawl before you walk, right? Most people that sit for extended periods of time decondition their core, decondition their spine, so we need to build that back up. So again, Go look at our videos, go check out the dead bugs, probably one of my favorite overall for people to start out with. You start out very basic. You want to make sure you experience no back tension or back pain. Then we look to other things like bridging. I, I always give the patients side bridging as well. Again, things to slowly turn these, on, these muscles on. Again, I know they're boring and I know they're not fun to do for most people, 
But if you do them, you don't have to do them forever. You can get past those and do more fun, exciting things. So that's the idea. We want to get you guys moving better, get you stronger in the core, get you avoiding the irritating postures and, and the stressors, and you should be fine. It's honestly something that you could deal with on your own. I almost guarantee it. So we're going to open it up to any questions if we have. So I think Leon's going to let me know. Yeah. So I appreciate you guys, uh, you know, listening to me tonight. I hope I gave you some good advice. Again, if you have questions, just shoot e shoot it through the chat there. We'll, we'll we'll address them if we can. If we can't, you can always email us through the website as well. Again, go to our website. We have a ton of good information on there, articles on there about all sorts of things, posturally to exercise, the things to do, not to do, ways to text and not text on your phone. It's really important that we try to change these habits because honestly, if you don't change them, they're just going to come back. Even if you get hands-on work from me or someone else, it's going to come back unless you want to see me forever. But I'd rather you take care of yourself. So it sounds like... It sounds like we don't, we don't have a lot of questions. I hope I answered your questions <laughs> before you had them. Uh, but no, I, you know, I really w want you guys to take ownership of your own situation. That's why we created this Back Intelligence website, honestly. It's for you guys to take care of yourselves at home. If you can't find a good chiropractor, you can't get, find a good therapist, and you want to take ownership, you want to do it yourself, you can. There's a lot of things you guys can do yourself, and there's a lot of ways to avoid it. You're not stuck with back pain. You're not stuck with neck pain. I feel people coming to my office all the time just resigned to the fact that they're going to have pain all the time. And I, that's not the case. It really is. It's very rare that someone is going to have pain that lasts more than a certain period of time. But anybody that has pain, in my opinion, more than a month, two months, three months, a year or two years, there's only one reason they have that pain. It's because they continue to irritate. Unless there's some significant disease process or structural problem going on, it's because they continue to irritate it. I don't want to blame them, but I am. They, maybe they just haven't learned the ways to avoid irritating it. So it's really important you take this stuff to heart because I'm sure every one of you out there, if you're watching this, I'm sure you have some sort of pain or discomfort. You could be feeling better. I almost guarantee it. So again, we have a, we have a, we have a couple of questions, it sounds like. So the question becomes, what are the thoughts on Tylenol or ibuprofen, I think, for the, it's to ease the pain of arthritis? Well, I have to give you a disclaimer. As a chiropractor, I'm not allowed to tell you to, to or not to take medication, whether it be over-the-counter or not. Now, I think there's alternatives out there. I think there are natural alternatives. They, there's some studies that back up the use of turmeric, some on the use of fish oils. Yes, some of the studies aren't great, but we start to see those. And there's even studies now you're seeing out there that you, know, you don't necessarily have to take those medications. I will caution people that take those on a routine basis. They cause issues. You know, I know it's, you look on TV and it tells you, the commercial says, take it every day, but taking an NSAID medication repeatedly over time is gonna cause some major issues. Internal bleeding causes a significant number of deaths throughout the United States every year. So I would caution you on taking that routinely. But again, I'm not allowed to give you strict advice on it. So the question is, is it a good idea to avoid exercises such as jumping rope and jumping jacks? Depends. You know, that's, a, that's the answer for me. So if you had a significant herniation, let's say, or a significant disc bulge, yes, the compressive load of pounding would not be a great thing. Patients that come to my office with these situations, I take those out, plyometric type stuff. Even running, is, is, there's a lot of compressive load too. So we might take that out temporarily. But it really depends on your situation. So if you don't have any of these processes, um. then it should be fine. If you find out for any, for any reason that you do an exercise and it hurts more afterwards, it's simple. Don't do the exercise. That's my rule. Any exercise, even exercise I give patients, if they have more pain during it or after, 
Do not do it. It's not a good exercise for you. There's no one cookie cutter approach to exercise for people. We're all different. So Leon's going to pick out the, extra, the questions that are more generalized to cover a broader topic, a broader range of people. But if you have specific questions, you could always e email us through the website as well, and we can get to answer your questions. That's a good question. So twists. Are twists in yoga specifically recommended? Well, Besides flexion, so the number one way to cause irritation to a disc is flexing upon it. The number two way is twisting. So the worst thing you can actually do is bend to the side and pick up a load. We know that. Now, twisting is actually good in yoga, but the problem becomes a lot of the patients I see in yoga or that do yoga and have back pain don't have enough mobility in their thoracic spine. So if you don't have mobility up here, then what you're going to do, instead of getting the rotation up there, you're going to compensate and pull that rotation from your lumbar spine. Your lumbar spine has rotation to it, but you shouldn't put excessive rotation into it because you're going to cause irritation. So if this is an issue, if you found doing twists or doing yoga irritates your low back, I would encourage you to work on thoracic mobility, maybe some foam rolling. Again, we have videos on this. Thoracic rotations. Again, go to the website, go to the YouTube page, you'll find some stuff. Get your thoracic spine moving, and you'll probably see an improvement in your twisting and less stress on your back. But in yoga, as you twist, just be really conscious where it's coming from. If you run out of room up here, stop. Don't pull that rotation from your low back, because if you do, you're just going to start to irritate it. So the question is, is there a connection between certain types of food and pain in general, a nerve pain? Well, I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm not really going to give you a detailed answer on this, but we do know that there are specific foods that are what we've called pro-inflammatory. I'm sure everybody's heard of it. More highly processed foods tend to be cause more inflammation. So anytime you can avoid those things, we generally are going to see less inflammation. Less inflammation generally equals less pain. So got, looks like we've got one more question coming through, maybe. One more question. Um, why does it seem when I'm sitting on top turn and my back will end up hurting the next day in my lower spine? So this is an extremely common thing I hear from people. The question is, why is it when I sit in a soft chair or a couch, does my lumbar spine or my low back hurt more afterwards or the next day? It's simple. It's exactly what I talked to you guys about, right? So let's go do that sitting posture again, right? So when you guys sit, most people, hardly anybody sits like this for extended periods of time, okay, without a lumbar support. Most people at least drop their lower back out. What happens on a couch or a soft chair? Your butt sinks into the chair. So you're actually going to round your back even more. It's very difficult to maintain a good lumbar curve in a couch, especially a soft one or a soft chair. So a trick you could try is take a little pill, try to prop it under your butt maybe, or even get a harder pill that you could put in your low back to kind of keep that curve. Otherwise, you should avoid those positions. This is exactly why cars hurt more. People that drive tend to have more back pain a lot if they have these types of conditions. The reason is because those seats, most seats are bucket seats. That means your butt is lower than your knees. What happens there? Anytime your butt go below your knees, the chances of you rounding your spine go up. So most of my patients, I say, if you can tilt your seat pan, the part you sit in, if you can get that to go up and down, tilt it to get your butt at least even with your knees, even a little higher. It could be a little awkward to drive that way, just as long as you're safe. A lot of cars, you can't do that, though. So they make wedges you can buy, pillows you can put on to prop your butt up. And you'll find out, even on long drives especially, it's less pressure in your low back. I, so I think that's going to wrap it up for tonight, guys. Again, I appreciate you guys listening to me. I hope it was informative. I really do. Again, we have tons of useful information on the website, backintelligence.com, the YouTube page. Obviously, you're here. You know where it's at. So check out our videos. If you have questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. And I uh, hope you have a good night. And I hope everybody's staying healthy.